in the next few minutes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we create autonomous robots like this, small autonomous robots at the University of Pennsylvania, and how we build artificial swarms. The inspiration for swarms, of course, comes from nature. Uh, but from nature, we also learn the advantage of building really small vehicles. So if you look at the swarm of honeybees, each individual is very small, very agile, and you can see from collisions with the environment, collisions with the neighbors, that they really don't care about how they navigate the environment. In fact, the sensors are fairly deprived, just like our robots, like the small one and even the big one. And so for us to build robots that can actually survive these collisions is pretty important. And the robot you just saw is actually only 25 grams in mass and consumes only six watts of power and can travel up to six meters per second. That's about 20 kilometers an hour. And it can sustain collisions, as you can see in this video. This is a video that's been slowed down to 1 20th of its normal speed. So this Pico Quadrotor is able to sustain these collisions and continue operation. And this is pretty important if you want to build a large swarm of robots. But in addition to making them small and safe, we also want to make them smart. So we equip them with sensors, like the ones that you see here. There's a laser scanner and a camera that can actually sense the environment. And with a robot like this, we can actually run it through an unknown environment. And in this video, you see the robot navigating an environment right outside our laboratory. What the robot sees, you can see in the top right-hand panel. But the center screen essentially shows you the three-dimensional model that it's constructing on the fly. So this is a high-resolution model of all the corridors, all the rooms, and it's ending up in our lab, which is at the bottom of your screen. And you will see that this is a fairly complex model that's building on the fly. And with this model, it's able to reason about the environment, and that's what allows it to explore the environment. And here you can see the environment that's being reconstructed. And you might also find this particular reconstruction to be interesting. This is the robot was here last night, building a map of the stage. So robots like this can be very useful, as I'll show you in search and rescue operations. We're also interested in making these robots agile in terms of grabbing things. In this case, the eagle fishing for prey incredible coordination of hand, eyes, and so on and so forth. And here's our robot grabbing not fish, but maybe a rolled up roti. Uh, and it's going, at, it's going at two to three meters per second. That's pretty fast. I mean, that, that's a, a really brisk walk. So imagine having the agility to grab something as you're walking really fast. And that's what this robot is able to do. Um, here's another video that illustrates the agility of these robots. So now you're actually carrying a suspended payload, and the height of the robot plus payload is actually larger than the size of the window. So the robot has to adapt its flight plan to get the payload through the window. <laughs> but what we want to do, in addition to creating small and safe robot, is to build swarms of these robots. And again, the inspiration comes from nature. Whether you look at birds, bees, insect, or fish, nature has found ways to, for individuals to be compensated for their weaknesses. So small individuals are not as strong as large individuals. But you have collective behaviors that allow the team to be much stronger than the individuals. And we'd like to do the same thing. We'd like to create artificial swarms. And here, the challenges are really understanding the interaction of sensing, communication, computation, and actuation, all of which happen on this robot. But now imagine that also interacting with other robots in the team. So we borrow two organizing principles from nature in order to create our swarms. The first one you see in this experiment, where there's a team of four robots each robot is monitoring its position and orientation with respect to its neighbors. And so as one of the robots, as you can clearly see in this video, is being hijacked by a human, the other robots immediately react to that. And the team is able to stay as a cohesive group and follow the leader in this case. Now, in reality, when you have lots and lots of these robots, you have many of these leader-follower interactions, and that's why we refer to these as leader-follower networks. 
So this is the first key idea. The second key idea is this paradigm of anonymity. So by anonymity, I mean that each robot is agnostic to its identity and its identity to its neighbors. So when they are asked here to form a circular formation, uh, they don't know how many robots are there in the team, and they don't know the identities of their neighbors. So if you pull a robot out of the formation, or if you add a robot into the formation, they sense their neighbors, and then they spread out, and they're able to continue forming this circular formation. So in this particular experiment, you see how dynamic shapes can be created. So the robot started off with a fast-moving rectangular formation, changed into an ellipse, which straightened out into a straight line, and then again deformed back into an ellipse, and then again into a circle. And all of this happens on the fly with some high-level instructions that essentially describe the shape that you want to maintain. If we had a large room, if we had thousands of robots, we could have done something similar to what you see with the starlings, the picture I showed you earlier. So what would you do with these kinds of robots? Well, there are many interesting applications you can think about. I want to share with you in the next five minutes two applications that we are particularly interested in. The first one centers around a really important challenge for us, not just for us, but for the whole world, which is agriculture. As you probably know, a significant fraction of the world population is malnourished. And it's not like we're going to add more land and cultivate more crops, there just isn't enough land on the surface of the Earth, and the population continues to increase. And plus, we have water shortage, crop diseases, climate change, and so on, and actually the efficiency of production per unit square foot is decreasing. So what can we do about it? Well, imagine robots like this helping in precision farming. So in precision farming, what you try to do is to identify the vital signs for each plant on a regular basis understand how that plant is doing, and then control inputs that you supply to the plant. So what are the inputs? Water, fertilizer, pesticide. Obviously, water is a precious resource which you want to conserve, and you want to minimize the use of inorganic chemicals. And that's what precision farming does. So how can robots like this help with precision farming? Well, we can have robots autonomously navigating these fields, even without GPS, flying really close to the ground, individually or in swarms, and each robot essentially carries sensors like you see in this video. In this video, the top left-hand panel essentially shows what the robot is seeing. This is a standard camera. The middle panel on the left-hand side shows you infrared imagery, and the bottom panel shows you thermal imagery. And the center panel is essentially showing you the three-dimensional model that the robot is building of every plant that it sees. And you can imagine monitoring, for example, how rapidly a plant grows by doing this kind of an experiment from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, and essentially measuring a plant just the way a doctor might measure how a patient's health is progressing. So with these kinds of technologies, we can already do something fairly simple. So in this particular slide, you see a robot counting apples in a tree. So if you ask a farmer how many apples he or she has in her orchard, chances are that they'll be off by about 50%. So we're trying to get this accuracy down to 90%. The second thing you can do is measure what is called the leaf area index. So we take the observations, construct three-dimensional models, and then measure the amount of volume that the leaves occupy. It turns out that that is indexed, that is correlated with the amount of leaf surface area you can find. Well, if you measure the leaf surface area, you know how much photosynthesis is possible in every plant. And that then allows you to measure the productivity of the plant. Another thing you can do is use a combination of visible and infrared radiation to compute what is called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. In simple terms, you look at this picture, and you can see what is wrong in this picture. If you zoom in, you'll see there's a missing plant there. Actually, it's not a missing plant. That's a plant that's not healthy or is dying. So by automatically flying over fields like this, gathering these images, you can actually figure out which plants need your urgent attention. 
And here's another example where you're able to detect chlorosis in trees. This is something that farmers are concerned about, and standard image processing techniques on robots like this actually yield this information readily. If we're able to do this, you can improve the yield of every crop, of every plant, and we estimate to get yields of up to 10% better is easy. And we can decrease the inputs, particularly water, by up to 25% by applying these precision farming technologies. The second thing we're interested in is creating robot first responders. So imagine you have an emergency phone call from a building, or there's a gunshot that you sense through microphones, perhaps, in this particular building. So what do you do? Well, you call for the police, or you call for search and rescue workers or first responders. But now think about robots responding to this call. So here you see a swarm of quadrotors with downward-facing cameras rushing to the building. As soon as the operator says, there's something wrong here, and I need to find out what is happening in, in this general area. So the robots decide who takes up what position and how do they get to that position autonomously. The operator doesn't even know how many robots are there as part of the team. So this is done on the fly. And all the while, images from these robots are being stitched together into the mosaic that you see at the bottom right, and in fact, a three-dimensional reconstruction in the bottom center. And all this information is being gathered and fed back to the dispatcher. So when the police officers arrive at the scene, or the emergency response crew that arrives in the scene, they have complete situational awareness of this particular emergency, and they're able to react to it without putting people in harm's way. I want to share with you some experiments we did about three years ago, shortly after probably the biggest disaster, a natural disaster that's hit our planet in recent memory. This is, of course, after the earthquake in Fukushima. So in Sendai, three months after the earthquake, we entered we sent our robots into this collapsed building to try to verify the structural integrity of this building. Of course, we could have also looked for victims, but of course, this was three, uh, three months after the actual disaster. So what you'll see here are just two robots, and it's going to illustrate to you the kinds of things we can do autonomously. So you see a robot like this sitting on top of a ground platform the ground robot was actually developed by colleagues at Tohoku University. But you can see these two robots operating in tandem. So our robot is actually programmed to be lazy, and it hitches a ride whenever possible so that it doesn't consume battery power. And that's why it's actually using the ground robot to climb the stairs. But now, as this team enters an area with a collapsed doorway that the ground robot actually cannot go through, the aerial robot takes off, and it's able to go through the collapsed doorway across this bookcase, which actually human beings could not have done, and certainly the ground robot could not have done, all the while building a map on the bottom right-hand side. And if you had survivors, you could have been able to locate them. But what we're really trying to do in this particular experiment is just verify the structural integrity and build a geometric model. So these kinds of things can be done autonomously today with small teams of aerial and ground robots. And at the end of this experiment, we were able to build this high-resolution map of the seventh, eighth, and ninth floor of this particular building. Now, this experiment took us two and a half hours. Well, that's an inordinately long time. No rescue worker is going to wait two and a half hours after a disaster waiting for you to get your robots to do their thing. So what's the answer? Well, what if you had a swarm of 100 or even 1,000 robots? What if you could take the two and a half hours and make it two and a half minutes, or even two and a half seconds? So those are the kinds of things we're working on in our laboratory. And I'd like to conclude with a poster of a Warner Brothers movie that's coming, The Swarm. <laughs> the Swarm is coming. I don't know if you've... If anybody has seen this movie, you're probably dating yourself. It's an old movie. If you haven't seen the movie, I urge you not to see it. It's a terrible movie. <laughs> but I love the poster. It says, the size is immeasurable, the power is limitless. I hope I've convinced you of that. And in some sense, this is about killer bees, so the enemy is man. And even that part is right. The technology is here today, and it's us that's standing between this technology and really useful applications that could benefit all of us. Thank you very much. 
So before I walk off the stage, I want to introduce to you Yash Mulgaonkar. He's the real robot man who made everything happen. Thank you again.